<laughs> yeah. Y'all, yeah. if you want to go ahead and take your seats, we're going to get started. Is something going to happen? Something is going to happen. Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, When I become rich in hypothetical dreams, I think I'll buy the last comer, trash my three inch Kmart special for a flat screen, new blue way with remote control, Venetian rugs, wine coolers in the freezer. Say, some of my best friends are Latinos as often as possible. Make it a point to be seen, given back to the ruler. Become the founder of the exclusive organization, NQWBGT. Not quite white, but getting there. Mm. <laughs> no more where I have to boil in this crock pot with other hot, not true blue hostile Americans accusing me of being a 200 year old immigrant out to get their inch in the head. The American dream as one young man from North Dakota informed me, there's a black swimming to Africa with an Indian under each arm. Maybe I'll bet a yacht. when rape is just getting some. And then wonder why she's so hard, icy, so unfriendly, so unconcerned when you run into her on the streets. So tight, uptight, like most black women sometimes get. She's afraid to step on her porch anymore, afraid to attend to her geraniums, to walk to the corner to buy food, to get a morning paper. No warm gestures or greetings fall from her mouth in the evening when there is only a tinge of redness in the western sky. You see her rushing to or from bustle car, face distorted between a run and a fast walk, trying not to look sexy or innocent or easy or elderly or adolescent or middle-aged or preschool-aged or none of the varied and counting preferences of countless human predators. Sick men, angry men, some who work in offices, hang on corners, some in bushes, in local bars, grooming, waiting, smiling, warning some, wanting to beat down someone today, ready to blame any bitch, slut, whore for the one who left him. The father, uncle, brother, the mother who abused him, his mother was too strong, too insensitive. It's those women in the music video scantily dressed. It's those girls who cried wolf but let him in the bedroom. 
It's these women today who are the causes for the cat calling the hey baby can I walk with you, the hey slim from the corner, the bad thing from the small cars, the doped up daddy offered tanning at the club. The lover at the pools, he's the man, and she pays. Every time she walks on the street and she pays, every time she flashes a smile, because a smile is an invitation to defilement these days. Wearing shorts become a deliberate tease, a turtleneck, a long skirt become activators to his imagination. Being outside men, you knew he was waiting. Being sexually free meant it wasn't so bad, and fantasizing about it meant you got what you wanted. Him beating, bruising, fucking sweat all over you, and the him could be the one. You would never suspect that a him could be your father, brother, boyfriend, cousin, even your husband. Make it turn on from those simulated rapes seen in the movies. Even your husband may get off from those rapes reported in the TV news. Even your husband. And you pray that your son wants to come to the system and you see the subtle process occur over the years. You see the ego slowly replacing itself between his legs, his slickness crawling his way up to your child's man, the sickness that leads him to refer to a woman as one would refer to a chicken, downplaying the whole, downplaying the fact that she thinks, lives, breathes like he does, just a piece of meat, and before you see it coming, she's a piece of ass, some cat, some booty, some trim, and he's just getting some pussy, banging her cunt, and you unconsciously treat your daughter to look old, Young, black, white men in the ass too long to hunch shoulders, to have breasts, to have any resemblance to the feminine. Because it's a crime these days to be female. And our use of crime has been committed since the garden. A crime that says, no matter where you are, you're in the wrong place. No matter what you do, you do the wrong thing. And you pay for it as your daughter would pay for it. And as your sons grow older, they will shrug their shoulders in nonchalance and repeat that internationally accepted statement. What do you expect? You know boys will be boys. Even when it leaves 
us out in the cold. And some of us are not so lucky to inherit grandma's old quilt, buying them cheap in thrift stores instead. But at least an effort had been made to put those secondhand smells of what was not right and done out of sight, TV memories, and no understanding of why some would only warm blankets <coughs> in a blanket. Mm -hmm. Existential Youth, story two. My door was in a car pooled with buoyant young teens on their way to an after-school basketball game when a flashing blue light urged the driver to pull to the shoulder, turning them into a car full of fearful niggers. She came to me for comfort, dragging that same splitting fear from the scene of a crime, not actually committed. A light out on the passenger side. A black light lit up in her growing mind of abusive internet officers becoming a lab outside her streaming screen, like hundreds of three-legged roaches crawling out of their laptops, tops, surviving the journey from head-shaking entertainment to reality. I did not want to be her mother then, the articulate master of words, when there were no real words that could slay this, no light valued meal for her fast food hunger pains, no unfriending click off of the defending party, no sharp responses for trolls that trespass under bridges too long, no therapy for the unrelenting stalking of feelings you can't let go of, no personal status changes, and it has become obvious to even your warriors that everything has remained the same. No backtracking post to clean up the effects of another person's mess. My words and my doors are not my real words, but an automated summation generated from an automated system of abuse. The quick licking of the ass of an authority to escape the trauma of the present moment. The calm decision to never vent. Preserve your future, your priority, to stay alive, to stay alive. A simple light out to generate such fear is ridiculous. A simple light out to generate such fear is ridiculous. I once taught half school in college freshman grammar before I became a single mother 14 years before my daughter. I was a master of words until this moment with birds lying dead in my throat, proper subjects blocked by my inability to control another's actions against me. With what has become adjectives weakening by getting caught with an undefinable fear of having no power. No, you shut up. To be able to say that I was right without a doubt and that you were wrong, to yell at you from the opposite side of the ocean, just far enough away from each other so that neither can fully hear what the other is saying. And who really cares about what you're saying anyway? No, it's my turn now. You shut up and let me scream out your inadequacies to the world without taking a single survey, quality qualifier, without issuing a single IQ test or having a single poll to back up the fact that, yeah, I said the fact that you are wrong, an idiot, along with your mama, your daddy, or whoever your mama slept with that night. I heard a whole weekend was a blur to her. And your wimpy, limpy, wet sock, liberal, neo-Nazi, conservative friends, no, you shut up. It's my turn to talk now and screw that person in the middle the weak wizard behind the curtain, the bridge builder with the rubber nails and chisel, 
I don't know who the hell put him up to this or who is he to tell me. Not every slave owner was immoral. Not every white person is a cracker. Not every single mother is milking the system. Not every gay man is spinning and free. Not every Latino sneaks across the border to rob me of unemployment opportunities. Every American Muslim celebrates 9 11. Not every Asian loves me. Ramen noodles and has a black belt and karate. No. You shut your fat hole man in the middle. You don't know Jack. Or that every Joe is a plumber. Because on a scale from one to ten, myself being a ten, of course, anybody in the middle is just a fat. So workers of the world, you shut up about your salary, about your health care benefits, your tenure. Thank God you got a job and no security. Just eat more apple pack. Don't get sick. Teach our stupid kids or take your pink slips and shut up. So pro-lifers against safe sex, against gay marriage, spay and neuter your pets. Adopt some black children. Keep your legs closed. Don't marry a homosexual and shut up. So pro-choicer, general sediacs, unsanctified brainiacs, crack mama lovers, tree lovers. Freaks and free lovers, go rub yourselves, read your Bible, pray to your Lord, climb up a red wood, lock off your digs, pray for forgiveness, and shut up. No, you shut up. For the love of Harry Commissioner, for the love of Harry Reason, for the love of Cotton and our forefathers, who got rich off the backs of others, for the love of Satan and Bigfoot and the aliens who invade the earth within this decade, for the love of all oppression, vomiting, messed up little girls, turning their heads from their sins and political spins, for the love of light consumption, breast over construction, reality TV, and every other toxic prolonger of plastic life and artificial youth, and for the love of what is uniquely American and Christian and decent, and a preserver of the sanctity of marriage, with the two out of three divorce rate, for the love of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Shut up.
It's not a masochist fantasy, but all the while I know I would rather parents pain than nothing at all. Otherwise, it's corruption of the gene pool, baby. Laughing besides a sex pool, working on a tan I already have, or maybe a realization that my words are just weapons against an inner enemy. Or if I ever committed suicide, <coughs> I would only be remembered. It's just another dumb nigga trying to be deep. Thank you. myself in all these positions, uh, as far as uh, people saying they're not, you saying that you're not racist, you're, you're going to think that way. What I'm saying is if you respond to anything in this show, in agreement or disagreement or disgust, you are a part of it because you got a reference point inside of your brain that's reacting to it. And so if we see things from that perspective, that we are connected to all of this, it would make for an easier dialogue with somebody who's counting what we believe. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I had, I guess, sort of a two-part question. I'm interested particularly in kind of the collage techniques in your work and also like when you're working on particular piece, your process of like uh, inspiration and composition and like what's that like? And not to say it's the same. Like I have a system? Okay. Or no, just just like anything anything you could share about how okay, you I'm decide okay. what images to juxtapose and arrange. And just, yeah. Where it all starts with words, since I'm a writer, yeah. I come up with my titles first. Ah, because the titles are super provocative. So if I come up with the titles first, I connect the words in the title with a visual. Uh -huh. So I know I gotta have some flags in there. I have to have a girl in there. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um <coughs> and it well someone once told me that I could just kind of go on with this series like forever. And I probably could. And I might I might do that in, in ten years when I have money and nothing else to talk about. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, it is a process, but I can't really explain yeah, it to no, you. I, 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 don't, like, I, yeah. I just know that. You get in it. And yeah, I get in it, and then I hear a voice, which I hope is God's voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it kind of like leads me into to the symbolism to put in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because these are called sad bars, mm -hmm. like sad conversations. Does that make any sense? No, it, I kind of sense that it was something like that, so. Well, this show is yeah. more about what you're thinking yeah. than what, what I'm thinking. You don't really know what I'm thinking. <laughs> but this show is more about what you're thinking and what you come up with. And I remember having this uh, showing at Christian Brothers, and it was a diverse group. And one man was looking at something, I think it was something, he was, he was a Caucasian. I think it was a hot, the hot ass thing. And he was just like into his own world, just just laughing. But then he suddenly took over and he just kind of looked around like, oh, nobody saw me laughing at that. And so it's, it's a 
about what you, what reaction you have, your interpretation of it. Yes. So, um, bouncing off of yes, how long have, 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 have you <laughs> been doing this series? Have you been I started this when my daughter was three, and my daughter was 17 now. Okay. I've done this between life. different because I was half functioning mm -hmm. and so they didn't know where to where to <laughs> put me like it was a crossover in, in that I had an outlet and I think it's very important to have an outlet where you can you can lay your crazy down and uh, well I statement. I've had the pleasure of seeing this show in different iterations. And I told you, I think when we were talking, I always, this, this, this work always reminds me of uh, the visual version of Cindy Sherman, the photographer. Mm -hmm. You know, because she dresses up in all these personas and, and do this elaborate makeup thing and do the photographs. Mm -hmm. But this is so much on another level because number one is visual. Um, to the point that it's not a photograph. You have to manually create all of these personas and characteristics, but it's also a still version of a one-woman stage play, which would be basically impossible to perform because you would go probably mad halfway through the performance because it's to such extremes that you were able to sit down. My patients won't let me sit down and paint the same thing this many times, mm -hmm. no matter how many different forms I'm doing it. So that's a patience within itself. That takes a special train of thought just to put yourself in this many personifications without any flaws in it. Well, I'm telling you that I have, every one of these paintings, I have somewhat experienced this. Mm -hmm. So it's not, and that's what I'm talking about, the overlap yeah. into you being stereotyped into somebody else. Like I could be like a, let's say a overweight black woman on, on welfare. I mean, there's so many little components in that. And that, why should I point my finger at anybody and say they're less than me? And in essence, we all are stereotyped to some degree. To some degree we are, and it just, and, and to, the thin line between it is so makes uh, just just the idea and the notion of racism and, and sexism. It just makes it ridiculous. Yeah. Because you're prejudged before they even know you. Mm -hmm. you know, by example, I, I've been there. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Talk about your poetry. That was really powerful. Well, my poetry. I've always been a poet. And I want people to know that 
these poems are not like kind of off afterthought or the, of the paintings, or the paintings are not an afterthought of the poems. Is if they fit into it, and if you do personal book, you'll be able to see that they fit into each other. It's because me, as a creator in general, I have certain things that I gravitate towards, and certain things that I want to say. And uh, this is maybe over the top as far as content goes, and so since that's over the top, why should my writing be over the top? My life has been over the top. And ridiculous. <laughs> Come on. I have a question. Yes. Are these works for sale, and if so, is there a prices? They're not. I'm in the process of paper that I have on the market my work. I got to pay. And so you know, I had some of this on Facebook, and I had them like on uh, clothing, and you know, and stuff like that. And, and stuff. These are, it's not really artwork to me. They're like, it's like political. Mm -hmm. If I take this show out and I travel with this show, I would like it to be some, some type of social experiment. I don't consider this as dumb. Mm -hmm. Because they, they create a conversation. It's not the type of deal that you just go, you just come to, you give you a couple of cookies. And you know, you stand in front of the painting talking about, you know, the, the fried chicken you had, you know, what's the best chicken place with your friend. You have to really look at this. Yes. And that that's what I want. I don't want it to be just an art show. I just want it to be tied in with everything. And then what I basically want people to know is take ownership and accountability for what you think. That doesn't mean that you're a bad person just because that came through your head, but if you take ownership and then you start to do some sort of self-exploration and connect the dots, was, is this really my thought or was, was, or was I invaded by something in my life that put that there? Just keep it real and keep it going. Anybody else? I'm curious to know if you live with this work to display it in your home. And if yeah, so, yeah, what yeah, that's I like for you. I have in my bed and <laughs> I really have my home and I don't have a large bed with me. When people walk in, they just, I can't be in here. <laughs> Are some of your first ones that you did, and which are some of the most you know, recent you ones you did? Really tell the first one because they're sh they straight up talk about race with sexism. Like the one with the, the, the American Indian, that's one of the first. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first was the one, you know, the Osaka. Which one? The pink? With the white trash pickup? White trash pickup? White, white trash pickup is one of the things because those are so obviously racist. Uh, let's see. Hot ass. Those ones like that, those are the ones that would start it off because they're just so blatant, man made. And I have a story for each one of these. I, I had these hanging at Delta State, and uh, they wanted to be the ones explaining 
and then I ended up like those people stayed there for like two hours, wanted me to explain all of them, and I got a story for all of them. So um, that, and then when things kind of look like it's a lot of things in it, those were the final ones, a lot of content in them, like uh, the one of Cinderella, that's one of the latest ones. Cat Tea Party Land, me as a cat woman, a whipped cream steam machine. Do is, it's, it's a state where I'm doing it, but then I have this little voice in my head. Like I'm saying, I hope it's God, and I don't need medication, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I had to, and it's in one of my books that I outlined it, but I had one of the mixed feelings about it where I'm laughing at the title and laughing at the little stereotypes. I'm saying, God, why you got me doing this? You know what I'm saying? How am I gonna, how am I gonna sell this? You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna get massacred putting this out here. But see, when I started all those years ago, it wasn't, I don't think this would have been maybe kosher, but now it fits right in to these towns where people are saying whatever. Share, I know we probably aren't going to stay for hours, but would you share maybe one or two stories of, of just a couple of these? Just reflect on um, uh, this one. in uh, college and I went to school in uh, went to undergraduate school in Rocky Corps, Mount Rocky Corps, Mount State University of Massachusetts. Where are there? There's no black people there. That's 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 symbolic of something. I don't know what. Uh, that keeps uh, But uh, and uh, it was a weird experience because I came from. Memphis, and I wasn't really an artist then, but I know I knew I had talent, I knew I had writing talent, and I wasn't really getting the encouragement I, 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 I wanted from Memphis. And so I went to North Dakota, and it was like, I became just like a black goddess to these people or something. It's almost like they never saw a black, a black female, you know, <laughs> reading right by me. But uh, they started celebrating me at that cup. But it was a group of uh, students, uh, white students who just couldn't stand me, you know, you know that little JJ jealousy stuff. And so they interviewed me in the school paper, and they happened to be on the school paper. And when a little article came out, they darkened my face. Mm. And so man made. So in itself, you come into that, you wouldn't know my story. But I'm sure you get you know, something, you felt something coming off that you're not quite sure. And that's kind of what I want to leave people with. Like, what, what, what's my story? Why am I? 
want me to do something else? I'll take requests. I don't know I, 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 I couldn't tell you why, but I'm, well, I'm, I am a media studies person and a self-confessed TV addict, but the one about the HBO, the home office, I, I, was, I spent quite a bit of time. Okay, home box office. And this happened before my daughter was even born. I was a homeless for like two years. And um, basically home box office is like, you're living in a box. You don't have a home or office. Office and that, once you're at a poverty level, it's hard for you to, you can't clam out of it. I mean, you don't have an address. Let's say you went on a job interview, where are they gonna call? Right. How are they gonna get in touch with you? So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. Also, this sad bar, there were these videos out, I think they were in the 80s or something, called Bunk Fights, where somebody would go out on the street and see these uh, homeless people out there and would, would get them money to fight each other. So it was like entertainment, I think kind of like maybe, what's that in the 80s? Yeah, it, was, it, it became kind of entertainment, you know. They had all these little, oh, this deep, profound concern about the homeless back in back then. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh God, there's some homeless people. You know, this stuff has been going on for years. It's kind of like the underlying just hopelessness, and so I can relate to that. That's why I'm saying it's one of these things that, that touches on a component of my life. I know you're thinking, what the hell kind of life does she live? It wasn't a, it wasn't a happy one. I'm blessed. And that is, uh, if I hadn't went through the stuff that I went through, I wouldn't have a degree of talent that I know that I have. So it's all good. Anybody else? Don't, don't wait until you can give me a loan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So this show is so magnificent. When is your next show? Yeah. And if we don't have one, we need somebody to be working on it. Well, I'm so good for a extend this show and have okay. another opening. And uh, some of you weren't there. Who was here? You were here. DNA, you were part of the show. Uh, you were here? Did you see the video over there? Then that she did the video. And she's I would like to pull in artists to interpret. Choose what you want to to interpret in some other medium, creative medium. And so I would like to be, if this show is going to be extended, I'm saying maybe until the middle of October or something like that, uh, I would like to pull in some other kind of artists mm -hmm. from different medias to uh, for the, for the closing. Yeah. to come in and, and do that again because that was, and I didn't know what they were going to do. I was nervous, <laughs> but I didn't know what they were going to do. Anybody else? Okay, I'll ask you about your, your quilted pieces and your fiber pieces. How do they fit into this? The, you're talking about the series with the quilts? The quilts? Yeah. Colored cartoons and undeniable blackness, that's the name of that series. Okay. And I'm creating books for that too. All right. Yeah. Um, this is it about stereotypes, you know, that borderline. Most of my stuff is about stereotypes that borderline between truth and fiction. Right. Like some of it's true, you know, and like, uh, you know what people say, you know, who are the people that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Some people say, so I guess what I'm saying is like, do you do those pieces at the, just, you, because that seems like a different body of work. It is, it's entirely different. Right. And so do you just, you have an idea and you say this one goes for that one, or this idea goes for that one? Yeah, you know what, and now, since I know I have these different styles, I can assign, because some things won't carry over like that. Those quilted pieces, they're cartoony, that the big lives, big, that wouldn't carry over into this, and so if I had a certain thing that can feed over into that, I kind of was saying to that. But see, some of the poems that I had for that 
color cartoon series or in these books. And that's because I have the same things. Something. 
dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. It kind of led up to that. And we know that there are like serial killers come from perfectly good families. They just, mm -hmm. they, just, they, just they just serial killers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's not always the case. So this right here is like before and after. So I'm twisting it up though. So before she prettied and afterwards she turned to a nut. Before he was a cow. Then he turned into a burger. She was good, and she's 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 not so pretty. He's a businessman, you know, a person who was in corporate America, but he turned into a wild, crazy nut. So we don't know. We really don't. Somebody else. <laughs> That's me as Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> let, me, let me try to remember this one. Um, we have this concept of um, she's a public servant. She's supposed to serve, you know, she's serving the country or whatever. There is this, and then we know all about the politics of the Bush ministry, how, how how wonky and wanky that is, if wanky is a word, wanky would be a good word for it. I heard, to me, just being a, a black woman and just being in this kind of white, privileged, you know, universe with, with these people, I mean, this makes me, made me recall an interview that you, uh, when she was interviewed by a magazine, they were talking about her relationship kind of with the president, which I think some was, some was kind of going on with that. <laughs> and um, she told a story about how she would go to, I don't know, Camp David or something. She would go to Adams with them because she's not married or anything, right? And I'm saying, of all the stories to tell, why are you telling this story of how you, how you made fried chicken for the, how you made fried chicken for the president? What were you trying to, I just read, servant, slave, or whatever. It's like how you chose to present yourself. That is, come on. He actually, the president actually bragged about that. He bragged about he how she fried chicken. chicken. He enjoyed her fried chicken. Then she, she backed it up with another story. Yeah, I indeed cooked fried chicken for the president of Oops, come on. Camp David, all the places. And Camp David. Where they got catered food. And, and the, 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 was the wife there too? Mm -hmm. Serving him. Come on now. Somebody else. It's better when you choose. Yes. That's, that's me, it's Precious Dad. Okay. And, and cool, and everybody thinking that's, that was such a sham of a, sham of a, a wedding, a little show piece. He really didn't want her. And so he's like, a, it's like she married a dog. That's all I'm saying. She <laughs> married a dog. <laughs> and so here we go. We have the Taj Mahal in the background. That's the symbol of love, you know. And we have this book. He's supposed to be living with the lamb in peace. You know, she's the lamb, he's the dang dog. And he's just this fake little kiss. The wolf, the lamb, the Taj Mahal, this little fake little kiss. And then it, we got down to the real deal. It was the wolf and some lamb chops. How's <laughs> 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 that straight out? <laughs> Street hole? Down here, down here. Okay, so we have, she's walking the street, and the car coming back, and it's like she's a flower. And we got an actual hole, just chopping her down. Mm -hmm. 
so whatever kind of life she has, she does not have that life anymore. Holding the car, walking down, trying, you know, got in the car, chopping it down. And then there he is, he's gone. And then she's supposed to be like, in the point right here, she's a happy cat. I'm like, people want to see this, say that she's content with her life. And that's who the heck she is, who she's supposed to kind of be. And he's just a man in the car. That's kind of turning her into a kind of a cat. And a lot of women, I'm not saying all of you, some could be just kind of virginal and stuff. <laughs> a lot of women have probably been in that situation where they felt like they were less of them. Or they were supposed to present themselves as, you know, just kind of, that's what your function is. And I've, I've felt that. I've been in compromising situations where I had to lack survival. Somebody else? That's it? That's it? You guys want to walk around and do a trip? Thank <laughs> you.